do our passage for today. Good morning. Today I will be reading from 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 through 19. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Friends, one more time, I've got a question for you. It's a question I've been asking for the last several months. How many of us feel like that guy? That's right. Today we are finishing up our series called Blindsided, When Life Hits Hard. This is the last one, last one in the series, last chance to see that clip from Mike Tyson's Punch-Out. Uh, although I, I read somewhere that they're coming out with a, a new version of the video game, uh, maybe Mike Tyson's Punch-Out Quarantine Edition or something like that. So this might not be the last time you have to see it. Uh, anyway, yeah, so we're finishing up the series Blindsided When Life Hits Hard because this has been a season where many of us feel like we have simply been blindsided uh, by life, that we have been hit hard and in so many ways. And it really has seemingly come out of nowhere. I, I think back to January, and you're looking at your new year, 2020, and you're thinking about all the different kinds of things that could happen in 2020. I don't think any of us thought of this. Did this cross anybody's I'll, – I'll admit, I will say, and this is definitely a tangent – I'm not as surprised uh, as, as maybe some of you might have been, because about a year ago, I'm actually not joking about this, about a year ago, I watched a, or listened to a podcast called the End of the World Podcast. Okay, this is the kind of, I just, whatever, I'm into, you know, crazy stuff like that. Uh, the End of the World Podcast, it was a podcast on 10 different ways in which humanity could get wiped out. And each episode was one of the, you know, 10, right? Sounds like one of the most depressing podcasts ever for whatever reason. I found it really interesting. Ten different ways in which humanity could be wiped out. And I'm not going to lie, one of them was a pandemic. And so I listened to a 45-minute talk on a lot of the stuff that it, they're now talking about. Like in the news, I was hearing about this in this podcast. At the time, I didn't take it seriously because the other episodes were like, you know, about aliens wiping us out. And that, that was one episode about the possibility of an alien attack. Another about a comet uh, smashing into us and destroying us. There was one about computers, right, a computer takeover, uh, putting an end to humanity. And that, that was an interesting one. It wasn't even about, it wasn't like Terminator style. They were actually suggesting that the way it would happen would be something like some company 
would automate the making of paper clips, and they would write a program where this computer would just make paper clips, but then it wouldn't be able to stop making paper clips. And it would just make more and more paper clips and just consuming every possible resource available to making paper clips, and that would be the end. Anyway, so I didn't take this podcast seriously. And now here we are. We've all been blindsided by this pandemic and the effects that have come with it. And so we've been dealing with this question, what do we do? How do we respond when life hits hard? What do we do when life hits hard? And particularly, what I want to touch on today is what do we do when we enter economic hardship, right? One of the things that is becoming an increasing fear and increasing reality is economic hardship, that the results of this, uh, what's had to happen with the coronavirus and the quarantine and all of this, a lot of people are in a very difficult spot. Unemployment is way up uh, in a place it hasn't been in an incredibly, incredibly long time. And so uh, the question for us is, what do we do in the midst of difficult financial times? That, that's the question we're going to look at today. And the, the answer that emerges in the passage that Lissa just read for us is incredibly straightforward and incredibly simple. Here's what it is. In the midst of hardship, economic hardship, pursue godliness, not excessiveness. Pursue godliness, not excessiveness. Now, <laughs> what, what is excessiveness, right? What do we even mean by excessiveness? I, I think the reality, of, the reality is most of us we don't think of ourselves as being excessive, you know. We, we're not extravagant people. Uh, and the truth is, I, I think it's easy for us to say that, and the reason why is because there's always somebody who's more excessive than we are. Isn't that true? And there's always somebody with the bigger house, always somebody with the nicer car, always somebody spending more money on their, vac on their vacations. And so I think it's pretty easy for us to just sort of convince ourselves, well, I I'm not excessive. I don't, I don't live excessively. And I think that this passage, I'm going to be honest with you, I think it's just kind of, it's like the mic drop on this issue here. Because I think what this passage points to is something that is absolutely shocking to modern American culture. And here, here's what it is. How, how do we define excessiveness? Here how I th here's how I think this passage defines excessiveness. Excessiveness is anything more than food and clothing. Look at this, verses 7 through 8. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. Think about this. What this is suggesting is that if you just have food and clothing, the basic necessities, that is all that you need to be content. And I think a, a principle emerges out of this that we find throughout the Scriptures, it comes through here, is that there is... There is a ceiling. There is a ceiling to the amount of joy that can be obtained through the things of this world. There's a, there's a ceiling. In other words, once your basic necessities are met through the things of this world, then you, you reach your maximum potential for joy in the things of this world. And uh, let, let me read. There's a, and I've read this quote before just because I think it's so fascinating and so important. This is from the Washington Post. This is what it says here. A wealth of data in recent decades has shown that the more, oh, excuse me, that once personal wealth exceeds about 12000 a year, more money produces virtually no increase in life satisfaction. From 1958 to 1987, for example, income in Japan grew fivefold. But re researchers could find no corresponding increase in happiness. When people win lotteries, for example, initially there is a big increase in happiness, but then it reverts to its original level. Think about that. Now, what, what I want to do, I want to use an analogy to help us understand what I think is going on here. There is a limit, okay? There's a limit to how happy the things of this world can make you, just like there is a limit to how tall your body can make you. All right? There is a limit to how happy the things of this world can make you, just as there is a limit to how tall your body can make you, right? So, oh, we'll just use myself for an example here. Here we go. How tall can my body make me? I'm going to stand up. Here I am. 
I am a solid five foot seven, right? And th- that's it. That's how tall my body can make me. Now, if, if I don't stand up, so like if I lay, I'm going to lay down here. You're not going to be able to see this. But if I lay down, all right, then uh, now I'm, I don't know, if I'm flat, lying flat, maybe I'm four or five inches tall, uh, maybe six or seven inches if I've just eaten a lot of cake. Uh, but, you know, that, that's, that's how tall. So I have not reached my maximum potential for height offered to me by my body. So now if I get on my knees, here we go. Now I'm on my knees. I, I don't know, I'm about three feet tall. Uh, something. I've got a short torso. So all of my length is in my legs, so I'm still not very tall here. But I still have not maximized my potential for height. Uh, so now if I stand up, now I'm at five foot seven, right? And, and here, but here's the point. Now I've, I've reached the max. My body cannot make me any taller. Now here's the thing. I can try, and here's what I could do. I could, I could jump. We're going to try this. You ready? Here we go. Whoa, did you see that? Did you see those ups? Let me do that again. Here we go. Here we go. Whoa, look at me, man. I think I probably made it six feet tall, maybe. Maybe six foot one, six foot two. I'm not really sure. Uh, But here's the problem. Here's the problem. Then I came right back down again. Did you you notice that? Like, I did. I think I made it. I think I made it to six one, six two. But I came right back down again. And, 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 and here's what I think the analogy is here. For many of us, we need to realize that the things of this world, there is a ceiling. There is a maximum amount of joy you can get, and it's the basic necessities. And when we start trying to get more out of the things of this world, more joy, what happens is it's like trying to use your body to get taller. You can do it. You can jump, you can get taller, but, and you'll get more height, but then you come right back down. When we use the things of this world to try to get more joy, initially there is an increase. Now, that's what that data was saying, right? When you win the lottery, you get a big promotion. Initially, you're happier, but then it goes right back down. How many of us, honestly, trying to find joy through the things of this world, we look like me trying to be six feet tall by jumping. We are wearing ourselves out trying to find an increase in joy when we've, we've reached, the, the maximum is already there that we've reached through the things of this world. And that's really just through our basic necessities. The problem is, here's the problem, it, it's worse than that. Because the things of this world are addictive. And what that means is that you begin, I've said this before, when you increase your lifestyle, when you start living a uh, at a higher uh, means, all you end up doing is making normal more expensive. You make feeling normal more expensive. When you increase your lifestyle, it makes feeling normal more expensive because here's what happens, right? You, you get the new house, uh, and you love it. I mean, you're so happy, and you're happier than you were before in the last house um, for a while. But then on over time, the happiness that you had in initially, it goes back to the same amount of happiness that you had in your old house. But guess what doesn't go back down? The mortgage payments. You're having to pay this much more even though your happiness level has gone back to normal. You see, so what do you have to do? You have to keep increasing your lifestyle in order to get that high, to get that hit. You see, this is why it's just like drugs. Materialism, the pursuit of wealth, it's just like drugs. You know, we, we, we think about drugs and we think about drug addiction and we think about the classic kinds of addictions that you can have, alcohol, drugs, and whatnot. But we need to realize that th- those, those are obvious. We, we see the effects of addiction in, in very obvious ways, but I would suggest that the potential for addiction in the things of just the things of this world is just as great. It's just that we don't see it quite as clearly in large part because we're all in it. It's like a bunch of people that are all addicted, and they're all just trying to get that hit, and they have to keep getting more and more and more and more and more of that drug to get it. Friends, excessiveness, it does not make you happier. It just makes feeling normal more expensive. And this is why we shouldn't be surprised If excess is really like a drug, we shouldn't be surprised that the Bible talks about how destructive it is. Pursuit of excess is destructive. Look at this. Verse 9, it says this. 
But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Now look at that, that verse there. There's actually a, a progression. We see a progression in here. They fall into temptation. And then from temptation into a snare, which is like a trap, and then they can't get out. They're stuck in this trap, and then that leads to senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction, just like a drug. Then in verse 10, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. And the, the imagery here, the language here is is almost like that of somebody impaling themselves on a stake or a pole. This is what happens when you pursue excess. New Testament scholar N.T. Wright just sort of sums this all up incredibly well for our age. He says this, It is hardly an exaggeration to say that this famous passage is an indictment of modern Western culture. Never before in history has there been such a restless pursuit of riches by more and more highly developed means. Never before has the love of money been elevated to the highest and greatest good. So that if someone asks you, why did you do that? And you responded, because I could make more money that way. That would be the end of the conversation. Think about that. I want to pause there and I'm going to go on reading what he has to say. But I think that's a tremendous insight. And I think he's right. Isn't it true? I, if, you, if you take a new job and, and someone says, hey, why'd you take the job? If you just say, well, it pays more, like, oh, that's it. That's the end of the conversation. A anything else that might be considered is completely secondary, right? Uh, how many hours do you have to work? Uh, what is the work environment like? Uh, what, what is the work-life balance like? Uh, it doesn't, you know, what, what is it? It doesn't matter. Maybe you have to uproot your family. Maybe you have to completely change your, uh, your dynamics at home. Those are all secondary issues, right? If you just say, well, look, man, it pays more. That's the end of the conversation. He goes on to say this. Never before have so many people tripped over one another in their eagerness to get rich and thereby impaled themselves on the consequences of their greed. The pursuit of excess the pursuit of really anything more than just your basic necessities, which really means we're probably all guilty. We're all, we're all caught in this indictment here. The pursuit of excess is destructive. So, instead of pursuing excessiveness, pursue godliness. In the face of hardship, in the face of economic hardship, pursue godliness. Verse 11 says this, But as for you, O man... Flee these things. Flee these things, right? Flee, run, get away from anything you can possibly do to get away. It's not like it's saying, hey, give it a try, you know? Just try. Just consider trying, not pursuing wealth. Just give it a shot. No, that's, <laughs> that's not what it says. It's like run, flee, get out of there. Run away from it like you would run away from a wrath tar. You guys remember this? You know what Rathar is? Rathar, remember this is uh, Star Wars. I think it's episode eight. Episode eight, uh, Han Solo uh, is transporting these Rathars. He's selling them, something like that. He's transporting these creatures that they have these, this massive mouth with teeth and these octopus-like limbs, and they're like one of the most dangerous creatures in the universe, you know, something like that. And he's transporting these, a number of these Rathars in his spaceship, and if you remember... Ray accidentally opens up the gates that allows these raptors to get out of their cages, right? And, and so what, are the next three minutes, everybody, whether you're a Jedi or not, you are running for your life. You are fleeing. I mean, there's nobody trying to hug a, rap, a raptor. Nobody's trying to cozy up to a raptor. Nobody's like trying to figure out, hmm, I wonder if I should consider spending some time with this raptor. No, you flee, you run. That's what Paul's saying should be our approach to the pursuit of excess. You need to run from it like you're running from a wrath tar because it's destructive. It'll steal your joy. Pursue godliness. 
not excessiveness. Again, verse 11, but the full verse. But as for you, O man, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Here Paul is, is doing what he does throughout a number of his letters. He kind of rattles off a list of virtues, a certain qualities that are a part of what it means to be godly. He does this in a lot of different different places. There's, of course, the famous passage in the book of Galatians when he talks about the fruit of the Spirit, rattles off a list of qualities, characteristics of a person who's being led by the Spirit of God. What's interesting is when he, when he makes these lists throughout his letters, they're never the same. No two lists are the same. So it's clear he's not trying to give us some sort of codified list of things that you're supposed to try to achieve. You should consider all of them, and it's pointing to a, a sort of a bigger picture, an entire approach to life. So because of that, what I want to do is instead of just unpacking each of those six dimensions, I want to look at three dimensions of godliness that I believe emerge in this passage and are, of course, related to those six and other, uh, other dimensions that could be mentioned as well. So three dimensions of godliness for us to pursue. And it's three dimensions of godliness that I think are particularly important when we are dealing with economic hardship. All right, so here's the first dimension. Appreciate everything God has given us. Appreciation. Appreciation is such an important part of godliness. Verse 17 says, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Listen to that. He's saying everything. He's saying you have, you already have everything, everything that you could really need. You already have. You know, here's the reality. How many of us, here's what we do. We tend to focus on what we don't have or we focus on what we used to have rather than focusing on what we have now, rather than appreciating what we have. Isn't it true? I mean, we have this tendency to, you know, we dream, which is great. Dreaming's a good thing. You dream about that new car. You dream about that new house. You dream about that whatever. And you, we, we focus on what we don't have. Or we regret, we think about what we used to have. But godliness is just resting in what we have, appreciating the things that we have. Listen, and this kind of gets back to a point that I, I made last week. And that is that you already have, like here, here we are in quarantine. This is why it's so important, right? Here we are in quarantine. So many different things have been taken from us, all kinds of things we can't do, all kinds of things we don't have access to. And what I said last week, and I want to reiterate, is that you have everything that you need for maximum joy right there with you in your household. You do. You have everything that you need. And so stop trying to fill up the gas tank with more. We're like a bunch of people that we're filling up the gas tank thinking we don't have enough when it's all right there. We already have it. First dimension of godliness is appreciating the things God has given us. Secondly... Become people uh, who give rather than getting. Make it about giving rather than getting. In verse 18, it says this, again, talking about uh, his exhortation to the people. It says, they are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Right? If you're going to be excessive, be excessive in giving. And, and what I love about this, verse 18 actually parallels Verse 17, which immediately came before it when it talks about God and how God gives, richly gives for us, gives us everything that we need. God is a God who gives. God is a God who cares for his people. And so godliness, right, godliness is about becoming more and more like God. And so as God gives to us, so also we pursue giving to others, giving, giving rather than getting. You see, this is a step beyond appreciation, right? Appreciation is, well, appreciating the things that you have. This is the next step. This is not just appreciating what you have, but giving it away. Being willing to give away the things that you have. We have a tendency, particularly in times of difficulty and in times of hardship, to hold on to things, right? Times of economic hardship, we cling to our resources, we hold to it and, and listen. 
What Paul is suggesting here is no, no, give it away. And see, this is, this is like, this is so incredibly countercultural, right? This sounds foolish, doesn't it? This sounds foolish. It, it, what I'm telling you, and I'm just going to put it this way, in times of economic hardship, the most important thing to do is start giving, not trying to get. That's the most important thing to do in times of economic hardship is to give away rather than trying, trying to get. I would say any kind of financial planning seminar, what do you do if you're trying to get your finances in order, how do you help to control your spending habits and all that? The first thing that I would say is start giving your money away. Start giving your assets away. It's countercultural, but we've got to remember, this is what the gospel is all about. And what, what do we claim to be as Christians? We claim, claim to be little Christ, followers of Jesus. And the heart of who Jesus was is that he's someone who completely, completely gave himself away. And that's what led to his vindication, his, his resurrection, that that is actually what led to life. Godliness is about giving rather than getting. So three dimensions of godliness. Appreciate everything God has given us. Give rather than get. And finally, pursue God himself. Pursue God himself. Verse 17 says this. Again, verse 17 as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. But on God. You see, the focus is on God. You know, I, <clears throat> what, what he's getting at here is we have a choice, folks. We have a choice on what we're going to cling to. Are we going to cling to God, or are we going to cling to money? And he just puts it, this stark choice. And, and Jesus does the same thing. He says, what's going to be your master? What are you going to surrender to? Is it going to be God, or is it going to be money? Well, you, you, you have to decide. You're going to cling to something. You're going to cling to something, and, and you have to make that decision. What's it going to be? Friends, I want to encourage you. The heart of the gospel is this. Cling to God over excess. This is the path to life. This is the path to joy. Jesus, at the very beginning of his ministry, in the gospel of Matthew, there's this famous passage, the Sermon on the Mount, and it's really the major body of teaching in Jesus' ministry, the very beginning of his ministry, and I like to call it his state of the universe address, right? Th this is when he really just kind of lays it all out. And you know what he says, I think, like 12 times in like 12 sentences? He says the word blessed. Blessed, which is a word that means happy. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are the godly is what he's saying. What he's announcing is that happiness is found through godliness. He's offering you that which you want so much, and it's through godliness. You know, I've shared this story before in relation to this point, and I asked my wife if I could share it again, but it just drives it home so well. I think it was something we can all relate to. So when my wife and I were first married in our first couple of years, uh, we had some challenges in our marriage, not, not uncommon for uh, newly, a newly married couple. And so we started reading this book, and it was on marriage. <laughs> And it seemed like the central point of this book, at least in the early chapters, uh, we, we never finished it. You'll see why. Uh, the central point of this book, the beginning, was that the purpose of marriage is not to make you happy. That the purpose of marriage is to make you godly. Actually, I think they use the word as holy. That's right. Holy. Holiness, right? So the purpose of marriage isn't to make you happy. It's to make you holy. And so we're, re we're reading this over and over and over again. 
Marriage isn't to make you happy, it's to make you holy. And finally, my wife, God bless her, in a moment of complete, humble authenticity, she breaks down in tears and she goes, I don't want to be holy. I just want to be happy. How many of us can relate to that, right? How many of us, we might not say it out loud, but, but we feel that all the time. I, you know, okay, I want to be happy. I don't want to be holy. I want to be happy. Of course, the heart of the Christian faith is actually you don't have to choose. You don't have to choose between holiness and happiness. You don't have to choose between godliness and happiness. You have to choose between godliness and excessiveness. And godliness is the one that leads to happiness.